Our scriptures this week comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. This is a familiar passage of the Good Samaritan. Listen to the word of God. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Then he said to him, what is written in the law? What do you need? What do you read there? Then the lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your hearts, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Then Jesus said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, the young lawyer asked Jesus again, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem from Jer to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him passing by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, and having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spent. Which of these three, do you think, was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? And the young lawyer said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Friends, this is the word of the Lord for us this morning. Thanks be to God. The parable of the Good Samaritan is probably one of the most familiar parables from the Bible. Like a classic book, the retelling of the story over and over again never gets old. Each time, the Spirit invites us to see things through different lens and perspective based upon our own personal experiences and relevance of our lives. Jesus used parables to illustrate his teachings, and we've seen that throughout his whole, throughout the Gospels, filled with suspense and human drama, yet embedded with a message of grace and mercy. This parable invites us to a missional challenge to practice what we preach into demonstrating our love for God and our love for for our neighbors. Upon a closer look, at times we may identify ourselves with any one of those characters mentioned in this parable. We could be the foreign robber, we, we could be the foreign robbery victim along the roadside, who was left helpless, abandoned, and neglected by the passerby. At times, we may identify ourselves as the robbers who seek our own gains at the expense of others' misfortune, while lurking and waiting for the right victims to come along, who happen to be at the wrong place and at the wrong time. This must not be their lucky day. At times, we may identify ourselves as the high priest or the Levite 
who noticed others in distress, but chose not to get involved. And instead of helping, instead of helping the victim, they chose to pass someone by on the other side and did nothing. They went on their casual way to go about their business as usual. I don't have time for all of this. I don't want to get involved. Let someone else deal with this man's issue. I don't want to get my, dirt, my hands dirty. What began as an inquire, inquiry concerning one's salvation, as offered by the young lawyer, Jesus turned his questions around into a teaching moment concerning the kingdom of God for the rest of us. What must I do to inherit, to inherit eternal life, asked the young lawyer to the rabbi. The proper theological response to the young lawyer's question is that there is nothing we can do to earn our way into eternal life. Nothing. We are saved not by what we do, but by what we believe. We believe and accept this eternal life as a gift, freely offered to us as an extension of God's grace through our faith in Jesus Christ. Both the young lawyer and Jesus knew their scriptures well. It says that the young man was testing Jesus. How dare that he challenge the rabbi about scriptures. Jesus didn't respond with a straight answer, but instead he responded with a question asking, what is written in the law? What do you read there? The young lawyer responded, quoting from both Jesus' teaching and from the book of Deuteronomy, saying, You shall love the Lord your God with all your hearts, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbors as yourself. Both Jesus and his, this young lawyer were probably having Leviticus chapter 19, verse 34 in mind, where it says, the alien or the foreigner who resides with you shall be to you as citizens among you. You shall love the, late, you shall love the alien as yourself. And for you were alien in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. As I was studying this text, I came across this commentary poem written specifically for this parable in mind. It is called A Collection of Attitudes. A Collection of Attitudes. And it goes something like this. To the experts of the law, the wounded man was a subject to discuss. To the robbers, the wounded man was someone to use or exploit. To the religious man, the wounded man was a problem to be avoided. To the innkeeper, the wounded man was a customer to serve for a fee. To the Samaritan, the wounded man was a human being worth being cared for and loved. To Jesus, all of them and all of us were worth dying for. The young lawyer then later asked Jesus a fair but a practical question. Who is my neighbor? The Greek term for neighbor, pesion, literally means someone who is near or nearby. But I would like us to stretch our imagination a bit more this morning. 
let us think more outside the box when it comes to who our neighbor is and how they may be how they may be defined. From our human point of view, neighbors can be defined by those whom we care about, but also those whom we may not have association with, or even those who may have done great harms against us, whether they're good neighbors or bad neighbors, they are still our neighbors. And Jesus called us and mandated us to love all of our neighbors, good or bad, as much as we love ourselves. From a missional point of view, our neighbors may be those who have yet come to faith in Christ. They may be the ones who are looking in from the outside or from the harvest field. From the harvest field, they may be in need of a special invitation in order to come into the harvest. Just as we talked about last week, when Jesus sent out his 72 disciples to be laborers in the harvest field. Or whenever we see human tragedy strikes, such as what we have seen again earlier this week, of yet another mass shooting among innocent victims, who just happened to be celebrating the 4th of July in the suburb of Chicago. We have seen the best and the worst of humanity on display once again. In times of natural or human crisis, we have seen how frail and broken communities come closer together by lending their moral supports with one another especially among those who have been traumatized through the acts of evil, uncertainties, and the unknown of our future. We pray that the Holy Spirit will console us, comfort us, and bind us all together, even though our lives may be shattered and our, li our dreams and our hearts broken. The road between Jerusalem and Jericho was about 18 to 20 miles long. That's about the distance from here to northern tip of Manhattan. However, due to its very winding and rugged terrain, it's not a flat road. It's not a flat 20-minute walk or 20-minute drive. It was a notorious it was notorious for robbers to stage their roadside ambush and to make their getaway and hideout after the attacks. In fact, this stretch of the road between Jerusalem and Jericho was nicknamed the Way of Blood because of the frequency of roadside attacks and for the blood that was shed there by the others, by the robbers. There's also this great elevation difference between Jerusalem and Jericho of more than 3,300 feet. From 2,500 feet above sea levels in Jerusalem to 825 feet below sea level in Jericho. As you can tell, this journey was not a road that should be traveled alone. One needs a companion literally and metaphorically. So as the parable goes, a man was robbed, stripped, beaten, half, left half naked and half dead by the roadside. He was desperately looking for help, but no one came to his assistance. Then came along the priest and the Levites, who both stopped and looked at him at the man on the ground and decided to walk across to the other side of the road and pass him by. Perhaps they were more concerned about being made spiritually unclean 
for coming near this man with the bloody wounds on his body. They didn't want any of this whatsoever. Then came the Samaritan, a Gentile. The Samaritan, who was never identified by name, took this huge leap of faith by stepping across the boundary in order to help someone in need. The Samaritan broke all sorts of rules and customs. We're not sure whether the victim was a Jew or not, probably is. Uh, but what's important, however, is that when the Samaritan saw someone in need by the roadside, he was moved with pity. In the King James Version, it was described that the Samaritan had compassion towards the man. Furthermore, not only did the Samaritan cross the social boundary, he reached down to bandage the wounded, the, the victim's wound. He poured oil and cleansed to cleanse and the wine to lessen the pain over his wounds. He saddled him on his own animal, whether it's a donkey or not, we're not sure, and put him up to a nearby inn to stay until he's fully healed. The Samaritan didn't have to do all of this. It would have been perfectly socially, culturally, and ethically acceptable if he had continued walking by and ignored the half-dead man by the roadside, just like the Levites or the priests. The Samaritan, as a Gentile, was not supposed to come into contact with the Jewish victim either. The Samaritan even left two denarii worth of money to the innkeeper until he came back from this trip, finishing what he had to do originally. The value of the two denarii was equivalent to about two days of wages for a field laborer at that time. It wasn't a huge amount. Nevertheless, it was still substantial. But the point is, he, wasn't, he didn't have to do all of this, but he did. He just happened to be at the right place and at the right time. He saw someone in need and he was willing to reach out and help that someone. He went above and beyond what was expected of him. Incidentally, I'm not sure if you noticed, Jesus never called the Samaritan good. We did. We labeled the Samaritan as the good Samaritan for what he did. I think that's significant as well. Jesus simply inferred that he was simply doing the right thing. Nothing out of the ordinary. Anybody could have responded the same way, but not everybody did. The young lawyer might have asked the right questions about eternal life, but with the wrong motivation. We must never feel that we need to duplicate the Samaritan's effort so that we may earn our way into eternal life. That's not how it works. God does not work that way. Our salvation is not based upon a merit system or a reward system. Anyone could have and should have done what the Samaritan did without hesitation whatsoever. In the same way, our modern day journey through the wilderness of life can also be a treacherous one. It is filled with danger, predators, lurking around the corner from behind or looking for their next victim to attack, be it on the sidewalk or on the train. With all these random and provoked attacks that we are facing these days, this becomes ever so real for all of us. What do we do? What do we do when we see a crime committed right before our eyes? 
Do we risk our lives to help someone who fell victim of a crime? What if we become victims ourselves? Will someone come to our assistance when we call for help? Or will someone just pull out their cell phone and start taking pictures and recording videos and post them on social media while making no effort whatsoever to intervene or to help the victims or even call 911? We've seen that quite a bit as well. Sadly, apathy has become an epidemic in our society today. Let us just mind, let's just mind our own business and pretend we didn't see what happened. That's unfortunate. Ultimately, not only do we need to look out for ourselves, but we must also need to look out for others. Need to look out for those who might have fallen victims of due to our society's neglect or abuses especially among those who are the most vulnerable or marginalized. The seniors, the women, the children, the sick and the poor, and those who stand out to be different from the rest. And yes, but not least, all the immigrants and foreigners living among us. They could not defend themselves because of their own outward appearance or their language abilities. We need to look out for one another to prevent such crimes from happening against our neighbors. These are our neighbors to whom we need to reach out to and extend our compassion towards. These are the victims who have fallen alongside the road, along the roadside, who have been mistreated, abandoned, abused, and neglected by our society today. We all have been victimized by the social norms of apathy and self-centeredness that have robbed us of our genuine relationship with God and with one another. We have been beaten and wounded by the evils and contaminated influence of this world or neglected to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly without God. The parable of the Good Samaritan is not, it's more than just a moral teaching about helping someone in needs. It is about how we relate to one another through crisis demonstrated humility and love. Instead of seeing the world through our human lens of prejudice, bias, and hatred, it is about expanding our horizon of the kingdom of God that is already here and is yet to come. It is about lifting our social blindfold, breaking down our stereotype, our stereotype facade and hostilities of divide among those who may be different from us. It is about taking a stand when we see acts of injustice and cruelty happening all around us right before our eyes, and we chose to do nothing about it. It is about stretching our imagination of what the world would become one day if we simply go the extra mile beyond what is expecting of us, just like the Samaritan. But is this all that we can do? When Christ asked us to love the Lord your God, our God, with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our strengths, with all of our minds, and love our neighbors as ourselves. Is this all that we can do? The journey of faith is more than just a road trip from Jerusalem to Jericho. It is a lifelong spiritual journey filled with many unexpected twists and turns, hills and valleys as we seek first the kingdom of God. It's about turning this parable into reality 
which you and I have been invited to take part of, with the Holy Spirit leading the way. So let us go and do likewise as Jesus commanded us. But know that God will never abandon us along the roadside of this journey, no matter what. Thanks be to God. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.